Hello, hello, and welcome to the G20 Interfaith Summit 2015. And as you've probably noticed, it's being hosted by none other than Fatih Sultan Mehmet Waqf University. And that Waqf part is exactly what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, so the best translation that we have, or rather that I have, um, in English is to call it an endowment. Um, you know, this is kind of how I would explain it to my parents back in Texas. And you're on the phone with your mom and you say, I'm talking at the G20 tomorrow. And she says, that's lovely, honey. And I say, you know, she's like, what are you going to talk about? I say, well, I'm talking about the walk. And she says, what is a walk? The easiest way for me to explain is to say, well, look, I went to uh, Duke University in the States. And it's named after Duke because he gave a lot of money and endowed it. And that money is used to fund all of its services, its social goods, its scholarships, and everything else that it does. But calling a walk an endowment vastly underestimates the social benefits of what walks were available, like what they were capable of during the Ottoman Empire, and what they can be capable of in what is an emerging Turkey. Um, at the beginning of the Republican era, era in Turkey, they were originally banned, um, seeing they were too Islamic, or they had too many ties to the Ottoman era, too many ties to the old and not to the new, and so they were shut down or in the very least, they were forced to go underground. Um, later on in the century, they were allowed to come back, or at least above ground, and to resume a lot of their services. And one that we have, and that has funded this university, is Fatih Sultan Mehmet Waqf. And one of the important things in understanding a Waqf in terms of sustainable development for Turkey is that these Waqfs provide a tremendous amount of public goods. Um, in the Ottoman era, they could provide everything from drinking water to elderly care to madrasas. They would fund mosques. They could fund all kinds of you know, buildings. They, elder, you know, people living alone, or they would sponsor widows, or take care of the children lost in wars, and uh, a variety of services. And what we see is a reinvention of the walk today along the lines of a Western model that's being used almost uh, entirely for education. Um, but there's a lot more to it, and I think in terms of a long-term progress for Turkey, it needs to at least tie back to what the Waqf is capable of in the Ottoman era, and to its origins not only in Sharia law, but also institutionally in the Byzantine Empire. So a lot of the base of this idea came out of research I did comparing Bourbon France and the tax farmers there, um, the subsequent formation of what's called the Ferme Générale, and Ottoman era tax farmers. Tax farming is really quite simple. The idea is um, you want to outsource the people who collect taxes for you. They bid, you get your cash up front, and then you sell them the right to go collect taxes from people in areas where it might be hard for you to collect taxes, or you don't have the infrastructure to collect taxes, or maybe you just need the cash up front. Um, and the argument that I made was trying to understand why in France these tax farmers collectivized and pooled their money. And they t stood together and say, hey, we have a lot of power now. And we can use the money that we have and we can use the tax farming abilities that we have to challenge the government. And these are the kind of the preambles, the proto-corporation. Uh, and they started to write legal, uh, a limited liability, what we would still consider as a limited liability track between who's responsible for what sum and whether or not a partner can leave without dissolving the whole entity itself. But you didn't see that in the Ottoman era. And a lot of arguments have been made looking at the Waqf. And they said, why is it that this Waqf is so powerful? And then what role does it have in keeping people from pooling their capital? The idea is the Waqf allowed Ottoman era wealth to securitize their wealth across generations. If you want to invest in a corporation, if you want to invest in an endowment, if you want to invest in land or something, uh, the idea is that you lock down your wealth across generations. In the Ottoman era, subject to Islamic inheritance law, Shariat demanded that inheritance from a father figure, or less commonly from a mother figure, would be divided up amongst the heirs. In the West, you have primogeniture, by West, I mean Western, East, you know, West European nations. 
Uh, and the idea is that the wealth goes to the firstborn son, or some variation of that. And so one pool of capital can be held across generations. When you divide up capital, it's less likely to be used for investment purposes, for long-term commerce, for more, uh, you know, braver long-term expeditions to other parts of the world or to finance trading with Venice or whatever have uh, the opportunities in front of you. And so people say, well, the walk was their security. They didn't have to pool anything and they didn't have to confront the government to get their rights. The walk already allowed that. Um, and a lot of the arguments around the walk blame it in a sense for why this what was a largely overwhelmingly successful economic model, these Islamic states that spread all across the world from Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, all the way up North Africa and around this clearly superior commercial organization. Why did the, organ did the corporation, the modern ruling feature of the economy not arrive in the Islamic world? And people say it's the walk's fault because it locked down capital across generations and it could not be used. The new Turkey needs to come to terms with its past, even if that past has tinctures of the old or the religious or this is the Ottoman era way, these are the Byzantine ways. The only way for sustainable long-term economic project within Turkey to occur is for people to understand and to come to terms with in my opinion, institutions such as the Waqf that have a grounding in Islamic law, provide public services, have a tremendous history of success, and are well received around the world. Um, one of the most important features of the Waqf is that it provides public services, and I've said this before, um, and I'm going to use a little, um, it's a bit of an out there uh, explanation to underline the importance of providing public services in, ter in terms of determining legitimacy as an organization, and that's Hezbollah. It's the party of God. Okay? In Lebanon and in other spheres, they started out as this radical, um, intense military, paramilitary group out of the uh, Lebanese Civil War. Um, and yet now, they have become, uh, by all means, a predominant political party with a wide base of support all across Beirut and outside of Beirut. And as contentious as they are, one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist, they win seats in parliament. They win seats in political houses. And people are always asking, how are they doing this? How do they make this transition into what we would consider legitimacy? Uh, I use that as a, it's a tinctured word. Um, but how do they become legitimate. And I would argue that they became so by offering public services better than the government could. In the Dahia districts outside of Beirut, Beirut, that perennial microcosm of what Lebanon is in general, they yearly millions of gallons of fresh water is trucked in, truck by truck into cisterns. They have cisterns placed throughout the neighborhoods. They set up generators and then keep them running, timing them with government issued blackouts. They have a group I forget what the translation is. It's the Reconstruction Organization or the um, Organization for Construction. They bring out engineers and agricultural scientists and help farmers better rotate their crops. They dig wells. They run privately funded hospitals with, by all means, some of the most advanced technology throughout the region. And what's more amazing is not that these services are just going to Shiite Muslims. They've, there are plenty of reports of Maronites and Druze and Christians of any different sect going in and using these services and requiring these services for the neighborhoods in which they live. These public services have changed the image of Hezbollah within Beirut, in the very least, within Lebanon in general. It's important to not underscore what an organization is able to offer people in place of the government in terms of political legitimacy. Usually we see it the other way around. Say, you look at a political organization, we have a political party, they say, hey, if you vote for me, I will do this. What you have from an organization like this is that I will do this anyway, vote me into power. So it flips the organization. 
And by no means am I trying to draw a distinction between a storied Islamic institution such as the Waqf that has been um, well-founded within Sharia law and an organization that's contentious internationally, respected by some, loved by some, and hated by others. I'm trying to draw a distinction about how important public services are in terms of determining legitimacy of an organization. The importance of the Waqf in the future of Turkey is precisely that they can offer more than just a university. If people are willing to look past kind of the tincture of what a waqf might be or what it was in the past, they could realize that this can provide child care, this can provide elderly care, this can provide all kinds of public transportation benefits, this can, you know, schooling and dormitories and funding for kids and scholarships and research foundations, and the list goes on and on. It's a way for people of tremendous wealth to solidify that wealth across generations. Um, providing public services, perhaps the number one most important part. And number two is that it has that Islamic guarantee. Um, and that's, that's also a very vague and nebulous term, but I think it's important to know that that's part of what gives it its, its security, is the idea that you can't tamper with it. You know, it's not a credit default swap. It's not an endowment. It's not something that can be touched by the government. It has been secured. And if you try to go after it, i.e., if the state tries to seize those assets, then there is a price to pay. Um, and that's something that really needs to be paid attention to. And that's something that can be very, very valuable in terms of securing long-term public goods. And then the most important part about the WACF for me is that and a long-term sustainable government and a long-term sustainable economic development uh, within Turkey, the Waqf provides civil society. It provides a buffer between the people and the government. In the States, I'm from the United States of America, we have a variety of NGOs, civil society, everyone from the NRA to the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, everyone from the American Civil Liberties Union to the American Enterprise Institute. And I would argue that every institution from labor unions onward offer civil society as a buffer between the people and the state to collectivize power, to collectivize their interests, and keep their interests in the minds of the politicians. And in terms of a long-term development in Turkey, you cannot have that without public goods without some kind of religious understanding of what they're able to offer, and without civil society between the people and the state. And in order to do so, I would urge you to consider the walk. Thank you.